that's not just the gospel, it's everything. It's discipleship, right? It's salvation, sure, but then it's it's discipleship of that individual and, and to help them understand and grow in all that Christ has commanded. And you see that happen through the establishment of, of local churches or small groups, small churches in those areas, right? Who can then continue to teach and train um, the individuals that are saved in that area. Uh, it, it also implies that uh, missionaries going forth from local churches, right, under the authority of local churches. Not that that's the way that God has always worked, or there have certainly been some individuals throughout uh, history that have gone kind of rogue, if you will, and God has used them mightily. But in terms of a normative pattern, um, what we'd like to see is uh, men and women raised up in the local church, sent out through the authority of the local church to evangelize and establish local churches in areas where Christ has not yet been proclaimed. Okay? So by, by, what we have here in terms of our lesson on missions in connection with church history is that we, we've been focusing on these key doctrines right, throughout church history and see where they've been challenged, where they've been affirmed, um, and um, and then followed throughout church history. And then we got to the point of the, the, um, the Puritans as well as the, um, the Reformation and the Great Awakening and things like that. And we asked the question last time, like what was the key uh, to the Reformation? We asked it last time, we answered it last time. Let's see if we remember it from last time. The key, what's the key issue or passion or tool uh, that led to the Reformation. We can the scripture? Yes. Sola Scriptura, right? It was, it was the, the passion and the zeal was to translate the word of God into the language of the people so they could hear for themselves um, who God was and what God expected of man, right? And to hear for themselves what the, the salvation or, or um, gospel message was in their own language to understand it, to be saved by it, to be transformed by it, and then to live it out to its fullness. And none of that could happen um, without the Bible in their own language. Otherwise, they were dependent upon uh, quote-unquote religious leaders of their time telling them what the Bible said, but all too often, they didn't follow it at all, right? And they, and they lean more heavily on uh, history um, and other things. What was that? Tradition? tradition? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Tradition. So anyways, we, we come through the, the Puritans and the legacy of the Puritans, which was um, reaffirming the Sola Scriptura, right? Reaffirming that it is God's word alone as the final authority with the passion to see that lived out fully through all of life. And then you have these missionaries who had the legacy of the Reformation, the legacy of the Puritans, um, who had now a passion to see people saved, to know Christ, and, and to see the, um, the word of God translated into their own language in these, these various people groups who had been unreached, who were considered the heathen, right? Who've never been, who never heard um, about Christ, about God, or about the word of God. And so at the beginning of the chapter, we see uh, just a quick legacy um, of one generation or one uh, we'll say generation or person, passing on their passion and their Christ-centered focus to the next and having that life and example stir up another person who then went to do the same thing. So we had, I think it was 11 uh, or 10 individuals that were highlighted for us in our chapter, all the way from John Elliott to Jim Elliott. Um, but you see that each one, you can see this chain of events where each subsequent person was encouraged and stirred up and convicted by the person before, whether by their biography or by a, a personal meeting with that individual or hearing that person speak, right? So John Elliott influenced David Brainerd, who influenced Jonathan Edwards. And Brainerd, and through um, the biography that John Eth Edwards kind of edited and put together from Brainerd's journal, was a, a specific encouragement to William Carey, and so it goes on, right? And William Carey um, was influenced, uh, or influenced Adoniram Judson, <clears throat> which is where we're going to pick up today. So last time we talked about uh, William Carey, 
um, who is, we would consider the father of modern missions, right? He went out, um, what's that? To India. Right? To India, exactly. All right, you're spot on today, Joe. Good job. Yeah, I didn't even write it down. No, you didn't even write it in your book, and you still remember it. I, these thoughts go through my head every now and then and just pop up. <laughs> well, I, they're, we're, you're, you're firing on all cylinders today, so that's great. Um, but he was a missionary to India, and it was, as we mentioned last time, you know, the notion of missions going out to other countries, to the heathens, they call them, or to people who had no understanding or had never heard the word of God before, uh, and in some ways kind of lived a more, um, what they would consider maybe backwards, or certainly not from a, a westernized perspective. Um, and so that, that was a foreign concept to them, to, to actually um, have people go and evangelize where the word of God had never been. Um, and so that's why you don't see a lot of these at this time, you don't see a lot of these missionaries being sent out by local churches, but what you do see is societies formed, right? Um, and with leadership and representation from a number of churches, but that's where the funding would come from, that's where the, the decision making in terms of what type of missions was going to take place, who they would support, that was all happening within these societies that were being established versus the local church. Um, and so that, that was a very common thing at that time. And William Carey, you know, we helped found what we call the Baptist Missionary Society. We laugh at that because originally it was called the Particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Heathen, right? <laughs> um, only, only his own work on, on this had a longer title, which was called an inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathen, right? So very long. Uh, you know, books like that would not do so well today. They have to have one kind of one name that has a very marketing focus to it in order for it to be bought. Um, but he had a particular passion for India, and, and as we went through his life and history, uh, but one of the people that he, he influenced one way or another was Adoniram Judson. And so that's where we're going to start. Uh, we're going to look at Adoniram Judson. Uh, we'll look at C.T. Studd and close with a, a personal challenge uh, from uh, Spurgeon. So Adoniram Judson, he lived from 1788 uh, through 1850. And, and it's interesting, we would call William Carey the father of modern missions. Um, and that was in Europe, right, where, where Carey went from. Uh, Adoniram Judson was actually the first American missionary overseas. Right, so we've had missionaries uh, like David Brainerd to Native Americans at the time, uh, but this is the first time where we had an individual going overseas to somewhere else uh, to evangelize the lost. So Adoniram Judson, uh, in your first blank here, was born in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, just 12 years after the United States gained independence from Britain. Right, so this isn't too long after. After that, uh, after that time, um, where Adoniram Judson was born. One moment. So, very interesting. Adoniram Judson was born into a Christian family. Uh, they, his father was a pastor um, and in a congregational church, or congregationist is what they were called. Uh, they would probably be more closer akin to what we would say, you know, reformed uh, today in terms of some of their theology, covenantal, and some of their thinking. Um, they didn't believe in baptism, uh, believe, baptism in terms of immersion in water. It was more sprinkling um, as an infant into the covenant family, uh, which is common in more reformed circles. Um, and uh, another thing that was interesting, as Adonijah grew up under his father's teaching, there was a specific teaching that, was, that was, began uh, part of, uh, he eventually, he would, it, uh, eventually he would walk away from the faith. Um, we'll get there in a moment. But one of the doctrines that his father taught that started um, this frustration, uncertainty, was that uh, his father believed that if babies died, they were fallen and would not go to heaven but go to, to hell. 
And, and is actually, that also is not an uncommon uh, viewpoint um, in the, the church today. It, it certainly is something that um, is out there, especially in, in reform circles, not all of them, um, but it does exist. And he just didn't understand that. And I think that was one of the, one of the initial things that started, um, that started to kind of in his heart that he started to challenge uh, Christianity. But uh, he was an extremely intelligent person. Uh, I think even at the age of nine, uh, in, in newspaper articles and things like that, they would have puzzles, uh, not necessarily a crossword puzzle, uh, but it would present with a, a challenge, um, almost like a, a word problem, if you will. Um, and, and he had snuck away, solved it. Again, if you, if you answered it and you won, you'd get a prize, right? So he was about nine years old, and he had solved it. Um, and, and went to a store to have it mailed. Um, the person said, the storekeeper slash mail person said, yeah, they'll take care of it. They ended up bringing it back uh, to his father. And so he actually got in trouble uh, for, for taking the initiative to mail something. It seemed like a waste of money and a waste of time over like a child uh, frivolity, right, of, of filling this out. And so his dad said, let me, let me see this. Let me see this puzzle. And he read it um, and, and soon realized that Adonaiam got it right. Um, and, but he didn't say anything, so Adonaiam was thinking he was going to be in trouble. He didn't know what kind of trouble he was going to be in. And a couple of days went by, didn't hear anything. And next thing you know, his father said, um, you know what? We're going to invest more in your education and training, um, have you spend more time with your, uh, with your uncle. I can't remember exactly what he, he did. Um, but to foster this intelligence that he saw in Adoniram. Um, one moment. That's why you're. That's why you. Don't know. <laughs> She's sweating. She's like, I can't find my book. I can't go to. I can't go to okay, school without my book. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but that that was the first time where. Uh, there was a sense of how, how intelligent Adoniram was and the shift in focus by his parents to foster that intelligence. Um, so he continued to grow up and uh, hone that intelligence. And after kind of getting through those primary levels of education, he went to apply at university. Uh, today it's called Brown University. Um, and so at that time, what you had to do, it wasn't like you just actually had a transcript in of itself and then you apply with your transcript, but what was very common is that you would go and, um, and you would have to take exams. And based on the outcome of those exams, um, you would be placed. You would either be accepted or not, like you just can't do it, um, or you would be placed in their education system. Um, and so he did through, he went through all the exams and went uh, to go look at, hey, okay, see, how did I do, right? And he saw all these, these people he had met, and they were all being placed in first year, and he, he didn't see his name. <laughs> and so he, he was downcast, he was distraught, um, and, uh, and then he, he was kind of off by himself, sad, and this, this person walked up to him, his name was Jacob Ames, and, and said, why, what's going on? You know, he said, first he said, congratulations. And he's like, I don't, I don't understand what you're congratulating me. I didn't even make the first year. Um, and Jacob, Jacob Ains showed him that he I was actually placed into the second year. Um, and so he, he continued to do extremely well. Uh, and, and from that moment on, had a strong uh, relationship and friendship with Jacob Ames. Jacob Ames, though, was not a Christian. Um, as a matter of fact, he was a, a deist. Um, does anybody know what a, a deist is or what a deist believes? God is in everything? Not quite. Okay. Not quite. But it was a good guess. Uh, anybody else? So a deist, you think about, believes that, um, believes very heavily on we know what we know by reason. And we can see by reason that there is, an, there is a God through uh, creation. However, um, they would not say that the Bible was the revelation of that God. Basically, that God um, kind of wound up the universe and then became very hands-off, right? So yes, there is some type of deity out there, 
but he's uninvolved, he hasn't revealed himself, and you go through life based on reason, right? And what you can find happiness in and what is true is all discovered through reason um, as it was initially kind of set up by this deity. Um, but in terms of afterlife, you know, there was no salvation uh, and things like that. And as he was doing so well uh, academically, he honed his ability to reason and argue and debate. And he had this strong friendship with Jacob Ames. And, uh, uh, and as that, you know, um, pride and reason, it gravitated and, and those concerns about how he was raised in terms of that theology um, led him to the point of rejecting the Christian heritage that he grew up with uh, to proclaiming himself a deist, a deist. A um, lot, of, lot of fun stories kind of throughout Brown University, but suffice it to say that um, he did graduate top of his class, graduating early. Um, but then in terms of what he was going to do next, he decided that he wanted to be a, a playwright, uh, a playwright. And um, at one point after graduating, uh, he went back to visit his parents, and uh, there was a, a, por a portion of time that he was actually a teacher there. Um, and after about six years or four years, he kind of established his own little school um, and even wrote and published a couple books through Brown University um, in relationship to education. Uh, but you know, he wasn't satisfied, right? And eventually he wanted to become a playwright. Um, but when he shared his desire not to continue with education, his parents didn't understand, right? He was successful, um, God was using him in that sense. Um, and through that argument, it came out, it kind of boiled over because they were trying to um, encourage him based on scripture and, and, and a kind of a Christian worldview of what to continue in. That boiled over into where he, uh, he eventually kind of blew up at them and said, I, I don't believe in God, I'm a deist, and I have been for about three years. Um, that didn't sit well with his parents uh, to the point where his, his father said, I, I can't, you know, I can't, I remember her name, I don't know if it's in here. Um, but basically he said, Ma, for lack of a better thing, please leave the room, I need to talk to your son, right? And so they spent the next, I think, six hours that evening um, going back and forth and every argument that his father um, uh, stated to Adoniram, Adoniram had a response. Um, and to the point where uh, he got to the point, he said, um, you know, well, you've been obviously trained very well by Brown University, um, but, um, and you come back, you've had an answer for every argument, but all I can tell you is that you're wrong. And, uh, and so that kind of, so at that point, his father um, just committed to pray. It wasn't going to be continued to argue with him. Um, but after he left that situation, then it was almost like a tag team. And whereas his father went after the heart, I mean, sorry, went after the mind, his mother went after the heart. Um, but nonetheless, Adonai was affirmed in his deistic views and his, his, his approach of reason. So he left, uh, I, I need to make up some, some time here. Um, he, he left and uh, moved to New York and uh, would just um, kind of travel around trying to find this group who, who could kind of start uh, um, a playwright slash uh, what do you call it? theatrical kind of group that they can do. But he didn't, he didn't really land with anybody um, and it became a challenge for him and he would just travel around with a small group, um, oftentimes going from one tavern or, or place to the next, sometimes um, leaving and fleeing after staying the night and eating food. He wouldn't pay, he would just run out of town. Um, and uh, it would constantly kind of be going around and around. Um, and then um, in terms of notable events in that time, uh, um, he had come back to an area close to where his uncle was and there was a new pastor there um, that would challenge him about his faith and have a lot of good conversations. And it was interesting because in that meeting, it wasn't so much that this pastor could outthink him, but there was something real about this pastor's faith that, that was a conviction to him. 
nothing changed necessarily in Adonaim at the time, but it was the, the passion and faith of this pastor that stood out to him. He left there and ended up in a tavern one night, um, or not a tavern, it's, uh, what do they call them, an inn, and uh, there was no room for him at the inn. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. There's no room for him at the end. Um, but there was one room, so he kind of went back and forth, and there was one room, there was a man um, uh, up in that room dying, and what they had done is, is partitioned off the room with a, a kind of a thick blanket, if you will, um, and there was a bed on the other side of it, and he said, we don't have any room, but if you want it, there's a person dying up there. Um, he's been here for a few days now, and will soon pass away. So that's the only place that we have. Um, and so it was better than the kind of flea-infested hay things that he'd been sleeping around. And, and so he took them up on that. And all night long, um, that person would moan and, <clears throat> and call out and scream um, and through the, the pain and agony that he was going through. And, and it kept him up all night, as you can imagine. But he was so confronted with his mortality because of this person's pain um, and kind of going through dying throes. And we know from Ecclesiastes, right? I was going to walk us through three or four uh, sections on it, but we're running out of time. Um, I haven't even gotten to CT stud yet. Um, that being faced with his morality, or not his morality, his, his mortality, it really challenged his thinking because for a deist, there is no salvation, there is no hope, there's only death. And so he knew that and being confronted with his mortality by this person's dying, um, it really challenged his thinking and began to open up his heart. Um, and so uh, that person, as he was checking out, the, the innkeeper asked, you know, did you get any sleep? Uh, and of course he said no, um, but later found out that that individual had that died earlier that morning. And uh, he asked, well, do you know who that individual was? And the innkeeper said, yeah, I do, because he's been staying here for five or, six, uh, five or six days, and his name was Jacob Ames. And it was his friend from college that had persuaded him to be a deist, and they were certainly close. And it just, it broke his heart, uh, and, and again, you know, it was such a, a moment of kind of oppression upon his soul, knowing that there is no hope, right? And, and the, the natural outworkings of, of deism and his close friend, right? So God had used that pastor. He had used the death of Jacob Ames. Um, and then eventually um, he went back home again, and there, was, uh, there were planting, uh, there was this group planting a seminary, um, in a rural area, and the leader of this kind of seminary planting had asked, asked if he wanted to join, not as a potential person for the pastorate, but as an opportunity for him to work through a lot of the questions that had been coming up. Um, and so he, he later on accepted that, and um, uh, after some time in it, eventually, in the quiet and by himself, he became a Christian. He had, he had worked through uh, his reason to the point of embracing the truth of Scripture, humbling himself before God, and, um, and becoming a Christian. And so, um, later on, uh, God would work in his heart um, not just to go into the ministry, um, but to have a compulsion to go into missions. A compulsion to go into missions. And he and a few other friends, see, even at this time, even in the seminary, the, the idea and notion of not going uh, into a pastoral role in a, in a church somewhere in, um, in the colonies was, was unthinkable and, and almost laughable. Uh, and so he did find a few kindred hearts, three or four of them, um, who were also very much interested in missions. Um, and, and they had went to um, a collection of local churches uh, to, to let them know that they would like to go um, to India. He had, even from the beginning, had a passion for Burma. Um, he had heard about Burma and had a, early on a passion to go there. Um, and so they did affirm that he could 
uh, that they would support. And it was actually the establishment of the first American society for missions. Um, and there's a lot, uh, kind of a lot of fun things that happened between that point and him going out into Burma. Uh, but one of the things that I will call out here was that he met um, one of those church leaders, um, had a daughter named Anne, and, and it was almost love at first sight for him. Uh, she was kind of a, a socialite. She was actually the first believer in her family, and later on her father and siblings' mother were saved. Um, but he had um, started a, a relationship. She was much sought after among the Christian men. Um, and, but they formed a, a strong relationship. Uh, she knew his passion for missions, and he eventually uh, wrote a letter. Um, he had talked to her about... Um, about marriage, and, and she referred him appropriately so to her father. Um, and he wrote his, her father a, a request to marry uh, his daughter. And that's in your book, and I, I do want to call it out here. So um, you should have two, two little paragraphs. Um, I'll read the first one, then stop. So if you think about asking uh, for a woman's hand in marriage, uh, you guys, um, I don't know if you want to follow this, but uh, let's read it together. I don't know if Justin wrote to Anne's father, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see... So he was on, he was on his way to the missions field, and he understood the hardships of what that life was like um, and what he was asking Anne to join. And so that was embedded in how he asked for her hand from her father. I, I, so he says, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure for a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to the degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Stop there. So, you know, if I had gotten that and they were asking for one of my daughters, um, I, I'd probably be like, no. Uh, no. But then this next paragraph, this next paragraph. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory, with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise, which shall re redound to her Savior from the heathen saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? Right? So he, so maybe, okay, maybe, you know, that Christ is worthy. And that's really what it's really about. Is Christ worthy to suffer? And for him to consent for her to go with him, and yes, likely to suffer and give her life for the purpose of the gospel. Um, long story short, her parents still were like, no, but we're not going to hold her back, uh, so it's up to her. Um, and certainly she, um, she did accept his proposal of marriage, and um, the newlyweds, uh, after two weeks, set sail for India. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why they started in India before they got to Burma. Um, we don't have time for all of that. Um, but they did, uh, in that time, they did meet with, uh, uh, had the opportunity to meet with William Carey um, and uh, talked about Burma. He, uh, William Carey actually had a son uh, in Burma um, who was married to um, a woman who is half Portuguese and half Burmese, uh, if that's right, Burmese. And, um, and that's why they were allowed to stay there, because it was very hostile to any other foreign religions. Um, you know, departing from the national religion to any other type of religion would have the sentence of death. Um, justice was really at the whim of the president or leader um, of Burma. So it was a very hostile environment. Uh, nonetheless, they ended up uh, in Burma and met with William Carey's son. And uh, not too long after that, his son and wife actually went somewhere else, and so they stayed in that missionary home um, and befriended the governor um, and governor's wife, uh, 
in that area. Actually, it was he had went and spent all this time with the governor. Didn't come to any good. Seemed like they were going to have to leave. But Anne, being the socialite, uh, chose to go and meet with his wife. Um, they kicked it off and had it formed a really great relationship. And through that, he had an ability to stay there and, and reach out to the Burmese people. Um, so, uh, let's see. I haven't got the CT study yet, so let me, let me go a little bit quicker through his life. Um, uh, I think in the first nine years, nine to, to, uh, nine to 10, 12 years, um, all the hard work he had done, he, started, he did start to translate the New Testament into Burmese. Um, but I think after, even after nine or 12, 10 years, there was only about, um, I think numbers vary, but at the most 18 people saved through all those years of hardship uh, and ministry. Um, and, and there was certainly a lot of hardship uh, there was constant sickness, um, and that overall started to weaken the bodies uh, of him. Um, he had lost two children, one on a ship, uh, another early on. It was rare and difficult for, for children to grow up into adulthood, and often they would die um, maybe at birth or even by two or three. Um, and over his life, I think... Um, he lost somewhere like six or seven children. Um, he, he was certainly uh, encountered a lot of sorrow from that. Uh, there was a point in his ministry in Burma where uh, Britain, in, Britain became or, or, uh, was at war uh, with Burma. And so even though he himself was from America, um, they suspected anybody of being traitors or spies. Um, and there was this order under the under the president called the the dark spot um, they they busted into his home uh, with a ledger saying the king has requested you and, and if you got that basically it means you were being uh, imprisoned um, and so they almost took his wife um, but Adoniram said you know let's just stick to the book in other words if she's her name's not in the book leave her alone they did um, and so he was taken to prison um, for suspected of being a spy, uh, not necessarily for the gospel. Um, and he spent 17 months behind bars in, in harsh conditions throughout that time and went to the governor of that area and tried to get him released. And while the governor was sympathetic, um, the, the, the king or the president was not. I'm going to call him president because king. Um, but eventually he was released um, I think as Britain won that war, uh, eventually he was released. Um, and, uh, but then even uh, uh, he had gone somewhere else and, and, and before he could get back to Anne, she had passed away. Um, and one thing I will mention about his time in prison was that he had, um, he had translated much of the New Testament um, by that time into Burmese. And um, he was very concerned though, while he was in prison, soldiers would come in and find it uh, and destroy it, and he would have to start the work all over, uh, which is a very laborious effort. Um, and so Anne had the idea of finding the most rotten, nasty pillow they had. And they actually took that, that New Testament translation work and put it in the pillow, um, sewed it up, and brought it to him in prison. And so he had his translation with him. Um, there was a point, uh, and so along, along this time with the, the ministry that happened, as I said, there was probably upwards of 18, but at this time, maybe only a handful of people were saved. Um, and so eventually, um, he, when he was torn out of his main prison for most of those 17 months, the pillow was left behind. And so now he's again, once again, concerned about, uh, about what was going to happen with this translation, if he was going to have to start over. Uh, even if he, he died, um, what would that mean for the translation? Well, one of the people that was actually saved um, had went to this prison looking for him, and, um, and while he was there, he recognized the pillow, happened to be Adonai's. And so he took it, not re realizing that it had the translation. And so God used that to preserve that translation work, and he continued that translation work 
eventually, after 27 years, finishing both the New Testament and Old Testament translation. He even started work on um, uh, a Burmese to English dictionary uh, for missionaries to come in the future um, so that it would make their job of integrating into that culture uh, much more um, feasible. So um, even though over the first you know, nine years or so of his ministry, only a handful of people were saved, um, as by the time that he died, um, more than 100 churches were planted and 8,000 Burmese professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, I, I would encourage you to go and, and listen or uh, read a biography on Adonai Judson. There's a lot more that, uh, that I wasn't able to cover for his life. But you can see he, he went through a lot of hardship in terms of losing people, a lot of sickness. As a matter of fact, he married two times more, and they both died at some points due to sickness and struggles with being overseas. Um, and, and you would ask yourself, like, is it, is it worth it? Uh, nearly 150 years after Judson, uh, Judson's death in 1993, um, Miramar, which is the new name in the 90s for... Um, for Burma, the uh, Miramar Evangelical Fellowship stated, today there are six million Christians in, in uh, Miramar, and every one of them trace our spiritual her heritage to one man, the Reverend Adonai Judson. So God used him mightily to translate, um, again, the New Testament into the language of the people, and through much hardship, um, eventually God blessed and created a lot of fruit in that area. Um, because of his faithfulness and the missionaries that followed him. So we'll continue on to C.T. Studd. You don't have any blanks there. Um, but what I would say is that C.T. Studd um, was born on December 2nd, 1860, so this is in your book, into a wealthy family in England. Sixteen years later, through the influence of D.L. Moody, he embraced the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. Um, he, was, he went to Cambridge, and at Cambridge, he was a world-class cricket player. Um, well, it's cricket, right? It's kind of like baseball, but not. There you go. That's my definition of cricket. Um, but nonetheless, he was uh, a, a very well-known and respected cricket player, um, and with every indication, after graduating from Cambridge, would be offered the ability to play professionally, and with that, to garner a lot of notoriety, um, to become a, a star, if you will, with that wealth. Um, but he was so convicted and uh, had such a clear view of eternity impressed upon his heart that he soon shifted his focus to missions. Uh, he was very much influenced by Hudson Taylor. Um, some of these quotes I will read because it reinforces this concept of a heartbeat for eternity. Uh, one of the things that he said is, what is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes to face eternity, right? So this is, you know, no one really understood his decision to go into missions and leave behind this promised life of comfort, ease, notoriety, and wealth. Um, and this was, these were his responses. He says, I know that cricket would not last, and honor would not last, and nothing in this world would last, but it is worthwhile living for the world to come. Last quote, how could I spend the best years of my life in working for myself and the honors and pleasures of this world when thousands and thousands of souls are perishing every day? So you can see in his life, you know, what stands out about C.T. Studd was he was so consumed with eternity and an eternal perspective that that passion for souls was amplified by that perspective of eternity, knowing that life would pass quickly, and he wanted people who had never heard the gospel to, to hear the gospel, um, especially in light of the brevity of life. So armed with this perspective, he went to China for a while under, uh, and, and worked with Hudson Taylor. Um, after he, his primarily focus of the time there in China was uh, working at a real rehabilitation center for opium addicts, sharing the gospel and seeing lives transformed by, by God's grace. And his, his time in China where he met his wife, Priscilla, um, they had four daughters together. Um, but then soon they came back from China um, and, uh, and spent a few years back in England, but then soon moved to India where Charles 
uh, or CT stud pastored a local church for seven years. And in that time, you know, he had his own health issues, including asthma, and would often stay awake most of the night just trying to breathe. Um, but even regardless of the physical challenges, right, he didn't let that sideline him. Instead, he continued to be faithful to, to, um, to preach the gospel, and many were saved in southern India. Uh, but once again, he, so he was in China, he was in India, and then shortly after that, um, he was convicted to go to Africa. And that's where he, he spent the rest of his life and ministry was in Africa. Um, eventually, he, he reached the Belgian Congo in 1913, and during various challenges and difficulties. At one point, he contracted a severe case of malaria. On another occasion, he woke up one morning to discover a venomous snake had been sleeping with him all night long. Um, <laughs> the snake wanted to be warm too, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, that's the, I think, especially in the 1800s, uh, early 1900s, that was common, right? There was constant bouts of sickness that these, these men and women had to work through in order to remain in those, those regions and continue to preach the gospel. Um, so a number of missionary stations were established. So basically, it was, is, if you think about rugged explorers um, cutting, cutting into the jungles and into the areas of Africa, going for 60, 70 miles, and then finding a, communi a community of aborigines or, or people, and then stopping there, planting what they would call a station to work with those individuals. And as that became established, then they would kind of um, navigate and, and cut into the land more and find another group and establish. And so that was kind of the pattern for them in terms of missions in Africa. Now, he wrote over 200 hymns and translated the New Testament into the native language. Um, eventually, uh, he did pass away in his 70s, um, having almost spent his entire adult life in missionary services, right? China, India, and then eventually Africa. Uh, you have this little poem that he wrote that I think really captures his heartbeat for eternity. Um, to, and I, I'll read this to you. I actually want to print this out and uh, put it above my, my desk where I work because I think it's... I had, had heard part of it um, from Don't Waste Your Life by Piper, where he recalls that this, this part of this little poem was something that um, his father had up. Uh, uh, but the whole thing here, let me read it. Uh, Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And um, frankly, I think we, we would all do well to heed the, the idea behind that poem and, and um, to shake off, right? This, this world, it just is constantly bombards our focus to place it upon the things that happen in this life, right? And that, that the time we spend here is all about this life, and, um, and it starts to dictate the decisions and influence the decisions we make. And we've got to fight for an eternal perspective, and I think a, a quote like this helps keep eternity in the forefront. So that, that was William Carey, um, Adoniram Judson, and C.T. Studd. Um, let's quote out, let's finish, finish our section here, considering the call. Um, what you have in uh, uh, your last blank here says the fruit of salvation. The fruit of salvation is entirely a work of God, yet he uses human instruments to accomplish his saving purpose. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, let me read this quote to challenge all of us uh, as we conclude this section on the modern missions movement, to be to to allow our own hearts to be stimulated and and stirred up with with a heartbeat for missions. And like we said with William Carey, right? We may not be the ones that go into the field, but we can certainly be the ones that hold the rope. And we need uh, to be holding the rope for those missionaries, especially that we support here at Crown Valley. Um, but nonetheless, no one in this in this room. Um, is beyond the call of God to missions. Uh, and so let's, let's finish by reading this quote by Charles Spurgeon. 
Um, I plead this day for those who cannot plead for themselves, namely the great outlying masses of the heathen world. Our existing pulpits are tolerably well supplied, but we need, we need men who will build on new foundations. Who will do this? Are we, as a company of faithful men, clear in our consciences about the heathen? Millions have never heard the name of Jesus. Hundreds of millions have seen a missionary only once in their lives and know nothing of our king. Shall we let them perish? The dangers, uh, the dangers incident to missions ought not to keep any true man back, even if they were very great, but they are now reduced to a minimum. There are hundreds of places where the cross of Christ is unknown, to which we can go without risk. Who will go? Who will go? And on that note, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to consider how you work through the lives of these individuals we covered in this lesson. Certainly, God, what stands out uh, more than any accomplishment is your faithfulness. It's your goodness and your kindness uh, to the lost and sending people out to proclaim your truth. Lord, it is... Uh, the heartbeat we see is your heartbeat, for you uh, desire no man uh, to die without your truth and your gospel being heard. Um, and Lord, so we pray that um, you would help us to think seriously about um, not only your gospel message, about the Great Commission, but how we may be faithful to support missions, whether that is in prayer, financially, um, in offering encouragement to those in the field, or perhaps even uh, someone in this room to go to the field um, to reach the lost where there is currently no proclamation of your gospel. Uh, Lord, may we have a clear sense of eternity, even as C.T. stud, and that that would be the dominant influence on the decisions we make in this life rather than the pressing things of this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.